Okay, everybody, the hour of 7.32 is upon us. We're ready to begin our meeting tonight, um, tonight's uh, business meeting. Um, we have two members we're not waiting on. They're not going to be here, so roll call, please, Ruth Ann. Member Exum. Here. Member Patton. Here. Member Glosky. Here. Member Fisher is here, and Vice President Hall. Here. Okay, we have a quorum present, and I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, President Dimmitt is not here tonight. Um, he gave me a statement to read out to make sure that I do this correctly. Um, he just wanted to let everybody know that he had another medical procedure this morning related to his stroke recovery, but the surgery went very, very well, and he'll be back with us as soon as he is able, so he's doing great. Um, and I also wanted to thank two people who are running our camera tonight. We have student Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Lubonsky, <laughs> who is a student at UHS. And we also have our regular Austin Pontius, who is also my name camera. So thank you to both thank gentlemen. You. <laughs> okay, um, I don't believe we have any additions, corrections, or modifications to tonight's agenda at all. So we will move along to citizen statements. Um, if anybody's here would like to make a citizen statement, please fill out the um, goldenrod sheets that are on the table in the doorway and give them to Lori. Doesn't look like anybody wants to make a statement. Okay, so we will move along. Um, we do not have a call for any executive sessions after tonight's meeting. So we are going to need an approval of the agenda, please. So moved. Seconded. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 No opposed? So motion carries. Okay, um, tonight we are supposed to be having a um, recognition for our um, Habitat for Humanity Club at the high school. Do we have anybody here who's going to be? Well, I think it's for a variety of people. Okay, mm -hmm. so I didn't know if anybody Dr. was Dr. Berenson, I don't know if you want to come up to the front. Oh, Dr. Berenson's going to do the presence. Thank you. We weren't quite sure if our teachers were going to be here, but right. here is a picture of them. Um, from our social media, this was um, Cameron posted this September 11th, and I'll read what it says for those of us who have not seen it. Congratulations to Urbana High School teachers Laura Quartz, Mark Foley, Taryn Smith, and Dave Dutton for being the recipients of the 2019 Voya Unsung Heroes Award. Voya Financial awarded these educators from a group of 650 applicants and 100 winners with a $2,000 grant to honor their innovative teaching methods, creative educational projects, and their ability to positively influence the teachers they teach. And Dr. Berenson, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. You can just go ahead and grab the microphone and press the button to make it go green if you'd like to say okay. a few comments. <laughs> So anyway, I would just say we're really proud of this moment and opportunity. And I probably would just say, uh, just talking with the teachers, uh, they didn't even think anything of it because it's what they do. Um, they were, obviously it was a positive opportunity and to be uh, recognized, but they almost looked at me like, well, for what? Because it's part of what they do and part of what they try to organize and work towards all year. So it just says a lot about their character and what they try to do. And so it's a great moment for our school. And uh, more importantly, I think they were thinking, what's their next project? Right. So really good opportunity. And just a little bit more about Voya, because um, we had to do a little research. We weren't quite sure. So they were actually awarded the Working for Justice. As you know, Urbana High School has long been a promoter of social justice. So for over two decades, Voya has awarded nearly $5 million in grants to help over 2,000 educators uh, bring their innovative teaching ideas to life. So uh, Dave Dutton shared with Lori, I don't know if you know this, Dr. Berenson, that this award qualifies them for a $25,000 award too, possibly. Yeah, they're in the running They're in the that. running for that. Yeah. So, ooh, so we'll have to keep our fingers crossed and send them best wishes for that yay Absolutely. Wow. so you want to show the little yes. we'll hold that up so Austin can see the there's their plaque with all their names and their little fake two thousand dollar check <laughs> yes. we, won't be able to <laughs> we can't cash it but we'll get it <laughs> so we'll, we'll in their absence we'll kind of give them a good shout out so. We'll, we'll be putting this up in the main office to, as a recognition so as we have guests to come through They'll be able to uh, see their accomplishment. 
And they chose the perfect spot to stand in the high school, be the change you wish to see in the world. So that's them. We asked down. them where to go, and they picked that that's spot. That's where they so wanted to stand. So. Yes. Awesome. Yay. Thank okay. you, Dr. Barrett. Thank you. Thank you. That's great news. Okay. Moving on. Um, we do actually have some policy review tonight, uh, 8.0 on the agenda. We have the Press Plus Issue 101, um, which is updates to our current board policies. So I'm going to let Jim yes. manage all of that. So I, I do want to get a little input, input from the board, and I hope, so Lori, you can take us back to our main screen. So um, you do not have, so just for our viewing audience, like if I hold up all the stacks of papers, a lot of paper involved in, in this actual uh, press adoption. So we did not make copies. Of course, we did not make this many copies available for the public as well, but uh, we have the policies if people want to see them as we discuss them. And so board members, the way administrative team did this is we took all the policies and kind of group them for you. So I guess moving forward as we have these big um, policy reviews, I just want to make sure that the way that we did this met the way you'd like us to do it moving forward. So uh, when we sent them to you to look through, we gave you three um, kind of packets, I guess. So one packet was, so this packet where all okay, no changes. So and you guys have been doing this for a while. So instead of us walking through like 100 of these, we walked through them as a team. And um, of course, our attorneys looked through them too. And all of the suggestions from press, if they were things that we were amenable to, we thought fit what we currently do, we said that we would adopt those and we thought they were okay with no changes. So that was one packet. But again, if you have questions about any of these, we can talk about those tonight. So you received the all okay, no changes. We're happy with the language that press gave us. And then you received another packet. So this um, particular press had a lot of five-year reviews. So um, you have a separate packet where basically um, press is asking us, hey, you've already adopted this policy, Urbana. Um, review it. It's been five years since you adopted it. Make sure you're still okay with it and go through all the language. If you want to change something, this is the time to do it. So we looked through those, our attorneys looked through those, and we were fine with, mo with most of them. I think there might be one that we're gonna talk about. So then you have a five-year review packet. So what Lori did is she took the, the five-year review, she compared it to the current policy that we already have, and we said yes, we were happy with these. So that was a separate packet. And then the packet, or mostly discussion tonight, um, there were things that as a group we felt were um, pertinent and should be discussed in open session. And so we have some that we've pulled out and you got those as a separate packet so you could not, I'm sure you read all three packets, but the one that we were gonna review tonight in open session was the one that we kind of encourage you to spend more time going through so we can discuss them in open session. Is that the way you'd like us to do that moving forward? Did that work for you guys? Yes, yes. okay. Yeah, no, I did too. My only question is, is just the sheer volume. I mean, yes, and, there and maybe was it's a because lot. it's the time of year, but you know, we, mm -hmm. we review these every, I don't know, twice a year, every season, yep. and a smaller number, um, especially things that had real substance. I don't sure. mean the ones that are just changed to, uh, to reflect legal mm -hmm. changes or changes in the code, but things that really had sub real substance. There were a lot. Yeah, and I, is, it, is there a time? So a there is a time. Thing? Is that why you felt like we all had to do it? Well, there is a time limit. So I think, um, one, we got this at the end of uh, our interim team's mm. time with us. And so there were a couple um, that we just kind of put on hold. Mm. And then we went for the summer. We left for July, and then we all came back, mm -hmm. and um, we have to have these turned in in October. Okay. So that's why we're okay. kind of doing them in a big group. More, more, more quickly than more you quickly would otherwise than yep. prefer to do. Yep, and that's why we don't have anything else on the agenda except this. Gotcha. We don't have any um, reports or mm -hmm. study session topics, so we could just focus on this. And again, this gives us... You know, we're not approving them tonight. It mm -hmm. gives us an opportunity as a team to go back. And if there are things that you guys want us to investigate more or mm -hmm. um, 
to talk to administrators about a little bit more or there are a couple that are related to health if you need us to talk to the nurses mm -hmm. it gives us at least another meeting mm -hmm. for us to go back and do that investigative work and then come back one more time before we have to approve them and get them off at the end of the month to press gotcha. well at, at the end of October at the end of October Sound good? Sounds good. So I think from now on we'll just kind of do, we'll do the heavy lifting ahead of time as a team, my team will, mm -hmm. and then um, we'll, and again, anything that you see in any of them are, is open for discussion. Um, we just felt like there were certain things, of course, we mm -hmm. don't want to make decisions for you, and then things procedurally that we felt like we needed to talk about mm -hmm. here for the viewing public too. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, so I'm just going to jump right into the packet. Um, for open discussion. <coughs> were you, is that for me? No. Nope. Oh, I thought you were clearing your throat to tell me something. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're going to just jump right in. So the first one that we wanted to talk about with you to get your input on is 2140. Mm -hmm. And that is communications to and from the board. Mm -hmm. So this basically um, is, is, um, not a lot of changes, but this gives the board the opportunity to have open, dis Ann and I were just talking about a, mm -hmm. a board, all board email that she received. Mm -hmm. Right now, what we do is when we, we comply with this because we list the FOIA requests at the end of our board agendas, this uh, policy is giving us the opportunity if you receive like a, a board communication. So we had a student, can I share your example? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we had a student who emailed the board Matilda Fernandez mm -hmm. and made a, a request to the board so that since it was sent to the board as a board communication that would be something this policy would give us opportunity to bring and have a discussion about here or to list it as we list FOIAs at the end of our agendas to say this was an all board communication and this is how we responded or didn't respond or mm -hmm. how we handled it so that's a that's probably a really recent example mm -hmm. um, and that is basically what 214 gives us the opportunity to do. Mm -hmm. So is that something you guys have yep. opinions around that or? I just use Matilda's as an example because we just got it like last week or week before last, but. No. Uh, yes. For me? Yes. Okay. So Lori, you're taking notes for me, right? Would this go under the communications section of the agenda then, or will we yes. put it at the end? Yeah. It would go where, kind of at the end, I think we would list it as we list the FOIAs. Okay, because, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's that section, that, section nine for communications. We could put that, it there too. That I never, I mean, in the years I've been here, I don't know that we've ever had anything listed in there, so. It makes mm -hmm. sense to put it at the end too, that's fine. For me anyway. Yeah, we can put it wherever you <laughs> guys care. want to. I'm looking at the notes to say if there's a specific place there where it says we have to put it. Oh. But I think we could put it in either place. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Do you mind if I write on this? Yes. Can I write on this? Okay. I mean, can I take it? So, yes, I'm seeing a lot of... Yes, okay. So, we'll move on. That one is a yes. I mean, I will see So, 2230. This policy is public participation at Board of Education meetings. So this policy, um, right now we currently set our uh, public participation for a five minute limit. I know there are times I mean, we don't run a clock or um, we don't have a visual like a lot of districts do, but we, John will give really nice reminders. You know, you've done that too to kind of remind people to stay within our five minute limit. This policy um, would allow the board to set a public participation time limit set for, a, for the segment. So we would say um, we would have a 30 minute is what they give as the guideline. Expansion of the overall minimum of 30 minutes for public participation and or we would have the opportunity for a 20 minute total length for a, any one subject it is the additional language. So again, we can continue mm -hmm. to do what we already do, mm -hmm. or we get, I, I thought we, it might be worth having some public discussion around your thoughts around these suggestions. Yeah, I had to read this a couple times because as I'm reading it, it's establishing a minimum participation time, and I don't know why we need, I mean, um, I understand the notion around a maximum saying we, we won't spend any more time than this, but why would we need a minimum amount of time? I mean, we, yep. so, so I, I mean, 
So this is giving us to say, okay, we would have a minimum of 20 minutes to talk about discipline or 20 minutes to talk about a new administrator hiring process or, and we would limit by subject or we can limit our whole time overall minimum of 30 minutes but, or but we can keep doing what we already do and just minimum. do our five minute. But limiting it would mean a maximum, but a minimum just says we, we you know what I'm saying? Yes. I feel like it's, it's the opposite of what, what, what I we, think the goal, what they're mm -hmm. intending. What the goal of what they're trying right, to do. Right, they say we'll have a minimum of 20 minutes. Well, it could be a minimum of 20 minutes, but we'll spend two hours on it, a maximum. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyway, so I, so I don't understand the purpose of this policy, actually, because I don't see a minimum as being useful at all. Mm -hmm. um, I am in favor of the policy we have currently right now, which is currently a, a five minute, and we have actually used a time piece a couple times when we've yep. had the, you know, a full house, and I think that's been valuable, but I certainly favor allowing, spending as much time on a topic as we need to, even if it's two hours, yes. and um, letting everybody speak who's here to speak. Right. Absolutely. I agree. Other people agree with that? That's Absolutely. what we thought, too. We definitely need to hear but we wanted to people's say. opinions, oh, totally. but the five-minute limit. Because the only yeah. time it ever is, is lengthy is when it's an issue that people really want to talk about. I mean, tonight, perfect example, we don't really need a time limit for anything, but... Mm -hmm. I don't want anybody to feel like they're being, mm -hmm. you know, squashed or silenced or whatever. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we agree as a team, but we wanted to hear your thoughts. Okay, so we will say no and not adopt 2230, and we will continue with our current procedures. Next is um, 41. Three, oh, oh, 415, the identity protection. We don't really need to discuss that, but that is, I made myself a note about that one because this is one that we would, HR would have to notify every staff member. So the change is mm -hmm. um, that we are now going, so if you look at number four, mm -hmm about social security numbers. Um, when collecting a social security number or upon request by an individual, we have to give the stated reason for collection of the social security number and it must be relevant to the documented purpose of why we're asking. Mm -hmm. So this will be something that we'll have to add to our uh, HR documents because it doesn't currently exist. Mm -hmm. um, so this is more of just a policy change, something we're gonna have to do not really anything we need to discuss. So that's more of an informational one, 415. 4130, um, this is the free and reduced lunch, free and reduced price food services. So we just wanted to mention this one out loud. Um, I don't know, Carol, if you wanna add anything, but right now as a CEP community eligibility, community eligible district, um, this would, really not impact us and only be applicable if we were no longer CEP. Mm -hmm. So we would change this policy to just uh, add a note about that and reflect that. Isn't that what, is that what Jean? Mm -hmm. It's only applicable if we're no longer a CEP mm -hmm. district. Okay. Because right now, because well, we're nobody, CEP, no kids pay for anything, everybody so. eats for free. So if we ever have to go back to paying, and I don't even know what we would, what it is anymore. It used to be a dollar eighty, two ten, mm -hmm. or something like that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If we went back to that, then we would have to pull this policy back out and look at it again. But right now, we're going to adopt it because these do live for like five years, and we will have um, we will add the note that it's only ap applicable if we're not eligible for CEP any longer. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right. Four twenty. Um, this is our fund balance mm -hmm. policy. And um, if you see the language, the school district seeks to maintain a year-end fund balance to revenue ratio of no less than 15 to 20%. Mm -hmm. um, our practice has been higher than that. It was actually in our strategic plan to have it be higher than 15 to 20%. That's always a goal, but I don't know if you want to add any more to that one too. It was actually 25% in our strategic plan, so um, we're not anywhere near that. So we it's a goal. it is a goal, um, obviously. So I recommend that we probably, we decided I need to go ahead and keep this because we're not even doing the 15 to 20% right now. But again, it's a good goal to have. And the language gives us that, that uh, leeway because it says we seek to maintain seek to that. Maintain. We always seek to maintain that. It's always a goal. Mm -hmm. We don't always reach it, but it's always our goal to, mm -hmm. to get there. So we'll, okay. we just wanted to say that out loud. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, 4170 is the, um, you're all aware of this, the new changes related to intruder drills mm -hmm. um, that we are required now. We've, we've been required to have one law enforcement drill that addresses a school shooting incident. Here we call it an intruder drill. We don't call it a school shooting drill. Um, but now this new language requires us to do that within the first 90 days mm -hmm. of school. Um, we have our first crisis team meeting this week. So we'll be planning for those drills to happen in the next two weeks, hopefully by at the very latest, the first week of October. Mm -hmm. So we'll be in compliance with this language. Again, I think this was added um, because a lot of districts were waiting to the end of the year to do their drills mm -hmm. as oh. kind of a checkbox, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, we've, we've not been doing that here, um, but I know that is why uh, this language was added to the School Safety Drill Act to require districts to do them earlier, which makes most sense. Mm -hmm. It makes more sense to do these as soon as you can get them in so students are prepared for the school year. So that is something we're already doing. We'll add that new language, but we, I just wanted to note that out loud that one, we're in compliance with that, and that the, the change to the 90 days. Can I just ask you a question about yeah. the policy? It's not sure. Uh, it's not something that's up for uh, change, but it just raised a question in my head. You know, in that policy, they talk about, um, you know, 90 days, uh, having this drill 90 days after the start of the year and requiring participation of all school personnel and students present, except for those exempted by administration or s school support personnel. Who, who would that be? Who, who? So um, I think, well, and I didn't say this too, another reason that this was added is because there are still some districts that have not been drilling with students. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've been doing that for a very long time. Um, I would say someone who an administrator might say would be exempt is if you have a teacher who maybe had a family member that was killed in an act mm -hmm. of gun violence. Mm -hmm. You know, you have those emotions and feelings. I actually in Champaign had a teacher um, who we did not have her participate because it brought mm -hmm. back too many um, memories and it, it was kind of a traumatic event for her and mm -hmm. so as long as she knew the routine she knew what the expectations were mm -hmm. in a real situation the drill was mm -hmm. something that she didn't need that extra anxiety just to do the drill so sure. we would have someone else go in in her classroom mm -hmm. and but would certain students be exempted I mean I can think of a large population of students for whom I know this might we be. still try and mm -hmm. you know Todd can weigh in but I know even our students that might be confined to wheelchairs and things like that we mm -hmm. want as many of our students as possible to participate I know mm -hmm. um, part of drilling you do you drill what you do mm -hmm. so I think our staff need to know if they have to pick somebody up and carry them out in a real situation what would mm -hmm. they do mm -hmm. same thing you do in a fire drill I mean they have to have we have to have those precautions mm -hmm. of how we evacuate the building mm -hmm. so Todd I don't know do we do we exempt any of all of our students participate? I think generally that's the case. I mean, there might be extreme circumstances, yep. other things are going on that we might, mm -hmm. you know, might not do that. But sure. And we can we can research that a bit more yeah, too. Yeah, and find th out. There is a reference to um, one of the public laws in here. We can we can double check that too. Yeah. The only other time that I can think of is um, I know fire drills can be very. Um, alarming for students with autism sometimes. Mm -hmm. Just the noises and the lights and the flashing and the um, mm -hmm. excitement of it all. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be another okay. exemption. Yeah. Yeah. Which but just raises, and this is the last question, because I know this isn't the focus mm -hmm. of our discussion today, but I assume, and I should know the answer to this, but I just want to have you say it out loud, that the way we conduct intruder drills is very age appropriate. How we do it in kindergarten oh, is not how we do it in middle school or high school. Mm -hmm. It yes. takes so into account. Yes, and I just actually met with uh, mm -hmm. one of the lieutenants who's in charge of that at UPD and the chief, and we we're starting to review our um, procedures and how we've been doing mm -hmm. them. It, it was good for me to have that conversation so I have a baseline of what we've been doing the last two years since mm -hmm. I haven't been here. Um, so we can pick up where we left off and just keep going and moving forward. And th I think we have some things that we, need, we can work on mm -hmm. per UPD. Okay. Um, but yeah, I believe everything that we're doing is age appropriate and we do have a lot of new staff who yeah. we need to bring mm -hmm. up to date at all of our schools. We've had, you know, a lot of new hires in the last two years. So I think it's important that they know the expectations of what to do in the event of an intruder event. Thank you. Other questions? This is a really important one. Yeah. Okay. So that was 4170. 
So our next one that we want to discuss is 4190. This is new legislation. This is the, I know you've all been getting those legislation updates. We've been sharing them with you around the threat assessment language. So targeted school violence prevention program. This is very new. So uh, we've been having a lot of discussions at our team level and um, Todd is has, we already have a threat assessment um, protocols in place kind of individually for students. But in terms of having a threat assessment team, um, that's something that we have informally had in place, I would say, but not as, as formal as this uh, policy requires it to be. So um, we're gonna be having those conversations. Our first staff development day is September 27th. Mm -hmm. So Linda Gibbons works with our social workers. Um, Todd, that's an opportunity for him to pull his uh, folks together. And we're gonna start that beginning uh, conversation around what a threat assessment district team meet, what it, what it is, what it means, what they do. Um, and we have until December um, to weigh in and let ISBE know what we're doing. We're also waiting, since this is so new, for a little guidance from them because they haven't really given us any yet. They've just kind of adopted the language. Um, so we are on top of this one, so we're going to adopt this one and work toward um, getting something in place by the deadline in December. Todd, do you want to add anything? You don't have to, but. Yeah, I guess, I guess I would add, you know, this, this came out in the last press, and I think even since then, um, there's a new law that passed on October 26th, mm -hmm. uh, that Public Act 101-0455, which talks about uh, threat assessment teams and threat assessment protocols. So it defines even more than what's in policy right now. My guess is press at some point will catch up with that. So mm -hmm. it's something we need to do anyways because laws have changed. Yep. I think we have a good beginning. Mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, we have some staff members that, have tr that are trained to do those, mm -hmm. but in terms of having a comprehensive district team, mm -hmm. that's something that we're gonna work toward. Other questions about that one? Okay. Once that's actually decided upon, is it going to be something that we send out to parents? I mean, will we make some sort of statement to the families mm -hmm. of, of what our protocols are, you know, in the, in the case that somebody hears something or sees something and, you know, sort of like which person in, in the district do we report to and how is it going to be handled? Yeah, part of that is, is uh, reporting protocols and, and who to talk to if you have concerns, yes. Yeah, okay. And so we'd add it to our district handbook. That mm -hmm. would be one okay. that would go in the handbook that everyone gets when they register. And then, of mm -hmm. course, we'd have Kim bring that to a principal's meeting so our principals know these are the steps. Um, and they can, sh I mean, if they all have PTA meetings, that would be a great place, I think, to have mm -hmm. that discussion mm -hmm. and say, here's something new. Mm -hmm. um, Good information for the website as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah website too. Yeah. Okay, uh, five 100 staff development program. We were fine with this one. Um, the only thing I just wanted to note is that we are kind of going above and beyond our um, CBA. This one is talking about um, allowing, let me get to that spot, it's a lot of language, the board credit. So we actually um, allow master's plus 60 board credit, and this is talking about using the bachelor's language. Oh, and this is also talking about the suicide uh, prevention, which we, we have suicide protocols as well in place already. Mm -hmm. So that one was a really easy one. 5220 is one that we've decided not to adopt, but we de definitely want your input. I guess I recommend that we've not decided. You guys are going to decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> We're going to recommend. Um, so 5220, the substitute teachers. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we, we have not only a teacher shortage, but we also have a sub shortage. And so this language uh, really ties our hands in a lot of ways. It, it, it really is talking about short-term substitute licenses. Um, it, it's requiring subs to um, pay for additional um, physical fitness tests and a physical exam. Um, other, other, just other things that we feel like we don't want to have to tie our hands around um, limiting what our subs can do and um, 
So this is one that we thought we would say no to unless the board thought this was something we should look into further and actually adopt. So, so Peggy, you look I like guess you well, want to ask a yeah, question. What you said makes sense to me, although I, I thought the point of this policy was that it would enable districts to hire short-term subs, mm -hmm. I mean, hire people that they otherwise wouldn't be able to So get right into now the pool. we already do this through our building-based, um, what do we call them, Andy? Angie? Building-based teacher subs. So we we already have all of these in place throughout the district. Wow. I can't remember how many. We have several at the middle school, several at the high school. Uh -huh. Does every elementary have one? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they each have one. And, and some of the things we offer really competitive benefits for our Turn your um, mm. we, ac we actually have competitive um, offerings for our building-based and district-based subs to keep them here in Urbana, mm -hmm. so much so that our um, our friends across Wright Street have stepped up their, their game to, mm -hmm. to meet what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm revisiting this policy from when we looked at it over, you know, we've been looking at it for a while now. And so um, some of the things here that they said, you know, substitute teachers receive only monetary compensation for time worked and no other benefits. We offer mm -hmm. additional things to keep subs happy here mm -hmm. um, because we appreciate the work that they do and we want them to choose Ur Urbana over um, some of our competing mm -hmm. um, districts. And so this was something that we did think that tied our hands a little bit and that's why mm -hmm. we were recommending not to adopt because it was saying that they had to have this short-term licensure and it was it just mm. seemed like it it wasn't necessary. Okay. Um, we had a little bit longer of a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, well, for for know. them to say they can teach no more than five days, yes, five consecutive days, oh. really limits our ties our hands. Sorry, my screen just shifted from what I was going to say. Because right now we already have long term subs that we can, gotcha. you know, mm -hmm. we hire them as long term subs so we can put them in places much more than five days. Right. And where they're compensated for planning and grading and intending uh -huh. nighttime activities. And then, you know, we have people that are going to the same buildings every day, which is really nice so that they're not going to different assignments every day and they build a rapport mm. with the staff. Um, so we just didn't feel like this, we felt like this was gonna tie our hands a little bit more. Okay, well that's good to hear. I know it mm -hmm. also talked about training for sub school substitutes. Yes. You know, on building operations and curriculum mm -hmm. and so yes. that. We, we do have a training program for our substitute teachers. Yeah, that's yes. what I thought, okay. It's not as in depth as I'd like it to be. I am familiar with the program and uh -huh. I, I would like it to be a little bit more and so that's something we're evaluating this year. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Other questions what about that one? Okay, um, 530, not anything really new here, just kind of adding um, this one, is this the, oh, this is the superintendent one. So this is the one that um, has some language around superintendent hiring. So um, the board maintaining a superintendent job description. Um, it gives the board the opportunity when you have a successful superintendent, you guys did, did do this, mm -hmm. um, they, doing the not just fingerprinting, but it allows boards to, um, when you have a candidate that you're interested in, to authorize additional background checks, um, going be above and beyond just the basic um, fingerprint background check, so the more in-depth background check. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's what this one Oh, and it also provides some language around, and basically we just did this too, um, the superintendent being able to hire uh, short-term and um, special project work. So you can bring in, well, I guess we didn't just do this, but um, the board reserves the right to bring in people for um, special projects mm -hmm. and short-term. Mm -hmm. His print is so small. Yeah, I know. <laughs> with my <laughs> number are you on? I'm on number 530, hiring oh. process and criteria. I don't think I have that. Yeah, that's, that's not in the oh, yeah, that's not no. in the packet? Yeah, oh, well, we'll sorry. have to send that one around to you guys. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know how we missed that one. It, it, it's in the other packet. It's in the review and compare oh, packet. Oh, it's in the I review, think. and I pulled it out. The review yes. and compare packet. Oh. It's in the review and compare because... Um, we made a we made a change to it. Okay. 
So I'll give you time to find it and look at it if you want. It's page it's 30 of 94. Okay. So I'll let you look at it. It talks about districts um, looking at personal online accounts, social networking websites, requesting from potential uh, employees their passwords to get into those accounts. So that's one if we're interested in. And then, do you guys have 535? Mm -hmm. Was that yes. part of your packet? Okay, good. I was like, maybe I pulled out another one. So 535 is basically um, complying with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Mm -hmm. And this is one, um, that we would have to, you know, it's a five-year review one, but um, Carol and I have had a lot of discussion. This is the exempt one, Carol, where we'd have to add. Right now, we've not, um, we need to go back, and this is something we talked with Angie about, too, is going back to all of our job descriptions and making sure that when someone is exempt from uh, comp time and overtime, that we are listing that really clearly on job descriptions. There have been some employees who have come back to us um, and said, you know, they, uh, we want them to be exempt from that. And mm -hmm. there's some very specific language around whether you can be exempt and why. So some people are exempt if they have it, uh, if they supervise other staff or if they um, have confidential matters that they're um, as part of their job um, but not everyone wants to be if we hire them and we don't tell them up front mm -hmm. you're exempt from overtime and comp time and we didn't clearly put that on the job description and it wasn't clearly posted when they applied an interview we can't turn, go back now and say sorry we think your duties and what you're mm -hmm. doing um, make you exempt from this it's, mm -hmm. it, we can't go back and change that so we need to go back and this is something HR will have to do. And, and it kind of came up as we were doing this five-year review. That's why these are kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, so it was something that as a five-year review, Carol, uh, remember there have been a, a few instances where this has happened in the last four, couple years. We've already had one happen since I've been here, an employee that we wanted to move to exempt. Mm -hmm. And we had to give them a choice yeah. because they were hired mm -hmm. as an employee who um, they, you know, they'd been hired and thought they would be receiving um, overtime and comp time, and then now we were kind of changing it midstream and saying, well, we, we think your duties are a little more um, exempt, and, you know, mm -hmm. this is what we expect, and when the employees said, no, that's not what I was hired to do, we had to honor that because it wasn't, it wasn't what we hired them to do. So um, that's something as we post positions, we'll have to be very clear about who's exempt and who is not mm -hmm. moving forward. So this is something that will have is kind of work for us, but it was good for us to review this because it brought several of those special circumstances to light for us. So that's 535. Almost done. Good. Good. <laughs> uh, do you guys have 5330? Okay, sick days, vacation, holiday. Um, this is just one that we just, you know, we, we wanted to just put out there because I know these are always um, discussions that happen when we bargain, and this, is a, this will be a bargaining year for us later. So um, there's language that we need to add in, in that after it talks about 40-week, 52-week employees as a condition for paying sick leave, and so we're changing that, that wording to say as a condition for paying sick leave of three days absence or more for personal illness or um, of 30 days or more for birth. Uh, and this, that would align to what we have in our CBA because right now this, this does not align to our current CBA language. So we're gonna have that aligned to what we currently do. So I just wanted to say that out loud. That's, that's the only change is that one little line in that paragraph. And I'll say it again. As a condition for paying sick leave of three days absence or more for personal illness or uh, 30 days or more for birth or as the board of uh, or superintendent deemed necessary in other cases. And then it goes on from there. 
So we're gonna we're gonna make that change in press so it aligns with our CBA. And next is um, 640. And the only change I just wanted to I know there was a lot of discussion in the last year about the acceleration policy. So this basically adds the um, the our acceleration um, placement policy to our curriculum development policy. And then I'm going to jump a little bit. I'm going to save 7190 and 7270 for the end. And I'm going to jump to 7305, the student athlete concussion and head injury. Mm -hmm. So this has been something, as, as you guys know, in recent years, con um, concussions, IHSA, IESA, uh, that return to play policy has been huge for student athletes. The addition to this is something that we've not been doing that we will have to do uh, once we adopt this policy is uh, we will need to distribute um, to all of our staff members and parents a um, Illinois Department of Public Health concussion brochure mm -hmm. that we do not have that we will be getting and um, making those available now as part of our registration process. Uh, already mm -hmm. our athletes when they go through the 8 to 18, mm -hmm. you know, when they sign up to participate as a student, um, I think at the middle middle level too, mm. but I know for the high school level, um, for for the eight to eighteen, they ha there's all kinds of uh, concussion protocols that the parents have to sign on, the students have to sign off on. But this is new, so this is where we would um, we would add this to station four at registration, where we have our physicals and immunizations, and parents come through. We'll make those concussion uh, protocol brochures available, mm -hmm. and those are those are available from the Department of Public Health. So that's the only change there. And then the last two, I think, are going to require a little more discussion. So um, 7190 and the Ashleys, this is, these are the, the couple that um, we started discussing in June mm -hmm. and we put to the side um, when Dr. Williams was still here. So 7190 is the um, medical cannabis mm -hmm. policy, and then if we say yes or no to 7190, then that um, mm -hmm. implica in, in, implicates what we do for 7270, which is administering medicines to students. Mm -hmm. um, that one has the medical cannabis piece as mm -hmm. well as the um, undesignated asthma mm -hmm. inhalers. So I know we had the discussion about that. So let's do 7190 first. Mm -hmm. And that is the um, controlled cannabis um, it authorizes um, that we can administer medical cannabis um, as part of Ashley's law so we had a lot of discussion about this <laughs> at our team level um, and at this point I think we and, and I, I, I believe <laughs> if we say no to 7190 we can say yes to the part of 7270 that al aligns with the asthma medication because we want to do that part. Mm -hmm. We're just really um, concerned about what it would mean if we open the door to um, students, uh, yeah, just having possession or, you know, being able to um, administer the medical cannabis there on campus. So I don't know what you guys, your thoughts about it are, but. Does that prevent a student who is prescribed medical cannabis from? So I think what we talked medicine? about is is at individual cases, right? I would think these would be individual conversations that we can talk to our administrators about this. We wouldn't want to, you know, say that student couldn't have access, but maybe we were thinking maybe the parent could set up a, a plan. We've got a couple of administrators in the room. I don't know if, what their thoughts are, but maybe the parent could come at a designated time and take the student out to the car mm -hmm. or if the student wa lived you know if it's mm -hmm. a high school kid they could mm -hmm. sign themselves out go home and come back mm -hmm. um, we just thought we we're open ourselves up to all kinds of things if we're just allowing this to happen right on school property um, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know that we would be saying no I think it would just be coming up with a plan mm -hmm. um, and I, we don't need a policy to tell us to do that that's yeah. just something we would do individually with students I don't know. You guys are sitting in the room, administrators, where you think I'm putting them on the spot. They're like, I don't know. 
I mean, I presume there's other medications for which oh, we have sure. parents do this type of thing already. I mean, so it kind of oh, makes I'm sense sure. when this yeah. is so new just to kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see how other districts are going to do this first before I kind of put ourselves out there and say we're going to do it. Um, I'd like to see how other people handle it, and then we can kind of learn from their mistakes mm -hmm. or learn from the things that they do well. Um, but I think right now we would we would work with a family mm -hmm. if they came to us and said this is something that they needed to do. Yeah. We would just individually make make it happen, make up, yeah. make it happen, and come yeah. up with a plan for it. Because I would, yeah. Um, you know, as I read through some of the, the press information, one, o one other concern out there is some of the interplay between state and federal, what's considered an illegal drug and jeopardization of federal funding. That's a very gray area right now, too, so mm -hmm. something else to consider. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm comfortable with your recommendation as long as, as you say, that there's accommodations made for oh, absolutely. students who need, need yep. this in order for, you know, for their condition. Yeah. So. And I don't know how we, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to limit how we would write those plans. Mm -hmm. I think we would just work with the family like we would for any, mm -hmm. you know, if this were just a regular behavior plan or a, mm -hmm. you know. Right now we have students who get medications for seizures or, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of things that they, you know, we, we work around when mm -hmm. they need to take those and who needs to give them to them and whether it's a nurse, whether it's a family member. Okay. Thank you other comments or so then if we say no to this part and I think Lori you uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong if we say no to it now we can always come back to it later and review it so so if we see some districts have come up with some really creative things or, um, or you know we can kind of keep monitoring it then we can always come back to it mm -hmm. and adopt it again mm -hmm. um, so I'll just say that. And then for 7270, we uh, have been kind of doing a little research around the, I know this was a, a big discussion here with the group with, um, with, with Dr. Williams around how we would uh, follow the, the spirit of the language here around that undesignated asthma medication. So um, right, we've gone back and forth as a team. We've kind of talked about would this be something we would put in the AED machines that we have all over the building. Um, I went to a superintendent seminar at the ROE this week and they gave me our stop the bleed kits mm. that we're going to give to our administrators tomorrow at principal's meeting. Um, so, you know, we get one kit per building, just like we have one AED machine per building. So we would, um, we're going to come up with a designated place where we put the stop the bleed kits. Mm. Um, we talked about putting them in the AED machine, but Todd's been talking a little bit more with our, our head nurse, our district nurse, and um, she's been talking to nurses. And we've decided that this would be something we'd put in the office mm. because there is language in here that says it um, not just anybody can give the student the inhaler um, if they come in and they have their you know this and, and again remember the spirit of this law is that these are these are students who have not been diagnosed or they're not prescribed asthma meds they maybe don't even know they have asthma mm. and you have a student um, for instance who you know, it's been really hot, it's 90 degrees, mm -hmm. they come inside, they've been playing at the end of the day, it's, you know, outside recess or our high school kids that go out or the, pe the middle school kids that are outside and they come in and their breathing is really labored. So someone in the office would need to be trained to see mm -hmm. what are the signs. Is this, is this asthma, is this just, you know, something else happening? So we, we want to err on the side of caution mm -hmm. and not have it just be, freely available in the AED machine where anybody can take it out and give it to the child mm -hmm. or the student, we want it to be someone that we would train on what they need to look for, you know, what are the, what are the signs around what a non-diagnosed asthma reaction might be. Mm. Yeah, and the, uh, the, in some of the policy notes it talks about it has to be a nurse or somebody trained, as you said, Jennifer, and ISB will be coming up with some training materials for that for and what that, that looks mm -hmm. like. Almost like, um, remember years ago when we, part of this language is also the EpiPen, mm. that we, um, we started having un, um, just available extra EpiPens in the office. Mm. And then we trained all the staff, is this is how you, and we, we were doing those like everybody was kind of 
stabbing themselves with the EpiPens. Like, this is how you, you know, administer an EpiPen if you need to. Yeah. And that was, our, you know, that was our training. And that yeah. was, it counted as a training and we had everyone practice it. So we'd have to come up with something similar, mm -hmm. you know, around how uh, that trained professional, is that a secret, you know, an office secretary? Is it? Um, when the student comes in the office, who's the first person they're likely to see in the event they are having a, an asthma attack and they don't even know they have asthma. Mm -hmm. um, we've also had a conversation about the prescriptions because again, not, you know, we're not just going to be able to go get a, um, a uh, inhaler. You can't just go buy them, you know, it's not something you can get off the shelf. So we would have to get scripts for them. Oh, it is. Yeah. Primatine Mist is back and available. Oh, uh, they do keep that. it in the pharmacy area. Okay, but you can buy one for about thirty dollars at either. Uh, haven't been to CVS. I know they have them at Walgreens. Oh, we didn't know that. So it's right at thirty dollars uh, mm. to buy that for yourself if you have to have a backup or something like that if you're traveling or without whatever, a prescription. Or if you have a prescription, I'm talking from experience. I have asthma. Life lifelong asthma so this is going to be one of my favorite topics of course uh, I've tried the new uh, primatine mist it's not as strong as the old because it had to be reformulated you know over the last five and more years that it's been off but it is available if someone has asthma and especially if they're traveling or something they can dodge in if their canister you know, has been depleted while they've been on the road or something mm. like that. So they are available. They're not out front. You have to go to the counter, and you do not have a prescription from your doctor or anyone to get one. And they're just as effective as they are enough to at least get you through yes. until someone could get there to help. Yes, you. Um, with my prescription inhaler, one puff is good enough for me. That's mm. an albuterol. With the new. Uh, primatine mist, which I used to have a canister in the car, one downstairs, one here, one there, you know, one out in the garage if I got too much dust in my lungs when I was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, out mowing the lawn or something like that or or whatever. Uh, the the new on, on the market is about two puffs to get about the same type of relief, but that's the only thing that's out there that I know of right now mm -hmm. that is non-prescription. Okay, well that's good to know. So that might have to fall in somewhere. Sure. We were, also. we'd, Todd and the nurses had done a little checking with some other districts. And so was it Unity or Tolono that yes. they, okay, I'll let you talk about no, that. Uh, yeah, we, we talk about these things as areas administrators and try and figure them out. But Tolono found a, a, a a provider who is willing to work with them. Um, we're also checking in with our school based health center and Promise Healthcare may be able to help us out with that too. And and we would only need one per bill. Like we right. would just need, you know, a, a doctor to give us a prescription so we could get ten, one per building or maybe eleven so adult ed could have one. Um, and but I like this idea of looking at that. So we'll have to share that with Tammy and have her kinda explore that because that would save us that you know, having to have the prescriptions. And then we'd have to, every now and then, you know, get another one because they only, I'm sure, I don't know how, I know the albuterols expire after a certain amount of time. I don't know about this one. So, yeah. okay. Uh, the, and most canisters have anywhere from like 150 measured ass puffs, like 150 up to 170. Some are even larger than that. But hmm. are you going to consider that? A prescription drug that has to be administered mm -hmm. or are we going to I mean allow a child to go ahead and carry a uh, primatine mist around with them because they know they're going to have to use it when they want to use it instead of trying to get to the office where their prescription is well I think what well, one this the spirit of this policy is for students that are are undesigned you know they they don't know that they have asthma or it's so new that the you know parent hasn't had an opportunity to get them a prescription or what you just said is you know a student might run out and they're struggling and they the you know they don't happen to have an inhaler there in the office anymore because you know they haven't brought a new one in so this would just be a safeguard for all of those mm -hmm. 
situations and as they come up. You're, you're right on Jennifer. We already have policy and procedure for yep. uh, self-administration of me certain medications, yep. asthma medications asthma, being one and of them. Asthma is one of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would work for kids who forgot to bring their inhaler Possibly. in? Possibly. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what we would do with this one is we would accept the school district supplies on designated asthma medication and we would come up with procedures, um, an administrative procedure for that. And then we would kind of put on hold the designated caregiver administration of the medical cannabis for now in 7270, if, if everybody was in agreement with that. Not that we can't come back to it, but I know there's a lot of discussion about cannabis right now everywhere, but I don't know that we, this is one that I want to be a trendsetter on. Uh, but again, we want to work with families that need, need it. Good. So. Have Can you I had make, anyone I'm, yet? Not that I know of. I don't know, have in the last year or two, have we? Okay. Well, since it's been made legal and people could have the prescriptions, I've not heard of, nobody's brought it to our attention that we might have some after tonight, people listening and watching, but, so. I have another question. You're saying sure. about training someone to spot. Uh, the asthma? The yes. Next, when we're doing something like that, uh, I'm starting to think, would it be practical, practical to make sure that two people within the district know how to do that? Should somebody be on maternity leave, all out sick, on vacation, so on and so forth. Oh, absolutely, and I think it, it's every building. So okay. just even right now, you know, we have, um, at our buildings, we have people who are, you know, have the CPR training, they have the AD training, you know, we make sure the people in the office know how to administer the EpiPens. So this would be something we would just add to their list of training protocols. So like, you know, the, if, you know, our secretaries relieve each other and take lunch breaks so you know you don't want this the the only sec the only person in the office who knows how to do it happen to be out at lunch or who's on, the only person who's trained so we would um want to train everybody who you know if a student walked in it might not even just be clerical staff it might be the student engagement advocate has an office in the office like a king that person's office is right there mm -hmm. um it could be assistant principals who have an office right there in the office. So if a student came in and needed help, we want whoever might be there, even the principal. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I don't think it would be a difficult training. I think, you know, once we put together something of these are the signs to look for and this is what you do, it would be very much like we do our EpiPen one. Really simple and easy. Very good. I'm, I'm amazed because growing up, I was the only person I knew that had asthma. It's pretty, it's a very it's common like It now. has gone like this yes. crazy mm -hmm. over the last several decades. Yep. And uh, having, sure. knowing what it's like not to be able to breathe sure. and mm -hmm. need relief right away. You know, I think environmental sure pollutions and just, yeah, you know, the definitely. things that are in the air now and all the chemical inhalants and things have added to it. Yep, that's true. Or even a child who's been out and uh, you don't know that they have an allergy to uh, bee stings, mosquito bites, oh, mm -hmm. wasps, and everything. Another reaction could be also you not know, being it, able to it, breathe. It, mm -hmm. The closing of mm -hmm. you know the windpipe and whatever is still the same type of thing that happens with with the asthma. And the albuterol helps that too. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes, yep. yes. You're right. So it's it's just random. Yep. Think about it all. Think about yep. it all. Okay, good question. Good comments, Ruthann. Any Anybody else? Other questions or things that we really didn't like highlight for you, but that you wanted to discuss? We're willing to kind of entertain whatever you guys want to talk about related to. So actually going back to the Ashley's Law, uh -huh. we're saying that if we get any of these cases, it would be looked at on a case by case basis. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, I, I just think want people to say that, when yes. they hear that we're putting it on hold or that yep. it's I know no, right I now think that they understand that if we do have absolutely a they just need to come and work up, with we us. We would be yep. working with that person. Yeah, okay. we'd work with that family and that parent and that student to get them what they need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, Tori. Okay. Yeah, I just, I don't think that we need to adopt a policy 
that you know once you put something in a policy it just I think I'd much rather be able to, to work with a family individually to you know help come up with a plan yep. okay so if you have other questions between now and our next meeting when we adopt these we're happy to go out and do a little more investigative work or um, ask around and we can call around to some other districts if there are things that you guys really want us to look into further before we adopt um, the whole Press Plus 101 as a whole. So just let us know. Okay. I'll turn it back over to Ann. Okay. There we go. Okay. Well, we don't have any communications. I mean, you did make mention of an email that we received from a student that was addressed about um, funding for the arts. And um, we are... And are working with that student that her name has come up a couple I think did Dr. Berenson leave um, doc, okay so uh, Dr. Berenson I, is aware and we happen to be in a meeting with um, Sam Smith from Craner so I think we are going to make sure Matilda and Diego get to the Illinois youth um, what is it called and all deal. state play yes mm -hmm. oh it's a really big, big deal. deal so yeah we're gonna make sure they both get the $500 that they need to get there it, it's huge it's a big accomplishment so yes it was, and kudos to the student for emailing yeah. everybody I thought that was yeah. pretty brave and yeah so it was and it was I, I mentioned it to you earlier because it was a communication to the board but it was it was it dealt her, her case was specific to that one um, source of funding but it was a greater question about how mm -hmm. is funding allocated for the arts when we do offer funding of similar nature to, for sports right. and so we wanted to look into it district-wide to see mm -hmm. what kind of answer we could come but that that so I'm glad that we got a response back to her but that would be mm -hmm. a good thing that we could mention in future uh, yep. agendas I'll double check with Dr. Berenson because he was going to reach out to her and I'll make sure that okay he did that and I know Carol and I haven't talked about this yet in terms of like a district line but I, there was so much support around you know, I, only because I didn't need to because we had people saying no we're gonna make sure they get there um, is is talking about a, a funding line for things that are not sports related is is what Ann's referring mm -hmm. to the students mm -hmm. said hey we send we send students to national you know soccer tournaments and mm -hmm. um, I know I, we have our debate team that does things and so mm -hmm. this student brought up a really valid point how are we mm -hmm. uh, being equitable in our funding for students who have opportunities to do things on a national level mm -hmm. yeah. for theater so right. I don't know that we've totally. had to deal with that before mm -hmm. so yep uh, item 10.0 administrative reports I don't believe we have any this evening nope. okay um, 11.0 action items uh, we have the minutes from the August 20th and September 3rd agendas to approve uh, but I'm going to group all this together with the bills yeah. and checks um, so then 11.2 uh, bills and checks for this month we have um, for education fund bills $725,000 Operations and maintenance, $206,000. Uh, bond and interest funds, zero. Transportation fund, uh, $18,000. Working cash bonds, $230,000. Tort is $182,000. Life safety, uh, $55,000. Payroll, uh, three, three million, I'll round that up to, it was 2.9 million, but we'll round it up to three million, and Urbana Adult Education, $65,000. Uh, we have no interfund loans. Uh, we do have some personnel items, um, standard personnel items that were listed um, that we need approval for. And then 11.5, resolution authorizing and directing the sale or disposal of personal property. Um, which it sounds like we just had some cabinets and shelving and things like that. So, mm -hmm. about right. and, and a, oh yes, a pole vault pit. <laughs> I didn't know that was something that could be. Mo I have an image of sand and. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, for all of those action items, I believe we have a vote for that separate from the others. Uh, so move approval of the consent agenda. Okay. I'll second that. Moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Member Exum? Yes. Member Patton? Yes. Member Pulaski? Yes. Member Fisher votes yes. Vice President Hall? Yes. Okay. Uh, motion passes. 12.0, uh, we have individual action items. So we have several gifts that we were lucky to receive. 12.1, uh, let's see. Uh, 
CU Autism Network donated a set of books to Urbana School District to further educate and support current faculty, staff, students, and families on the autism spectrum disorder and community acceptance and understanding of it. The CU Autism Network has created a program called Autism Aware. Mm -hmm. We also received a gift from Bonzo's One LLC, uh, who donated $100 to the Urbana High School cheerleading group. Um, they donated various items such as gift cards, backpacks, uh, oh, this is a separate group, sorry, I think. Uh, it, gift cards, backpacks, supplies, hygiene products, and blankets to help um, unaccompanied minors uh, throughout our school district. Um, these individuals were Julie Cartel, Jamie, and Gary Storm, and my apologies if I mispronounce anybody's name. Uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Champaign-Urbana, Immigration Justice Task Force, Kristen Walters, and Sarah Hogue, and the Stone Creek Church. Uh, the following donated a total of $5,890 to the Urbana High School Marching Band. William and Catherine Falstich, Stana Breen, Stephanie and Thomas Nevins, Albert Veloki and Ann Hines Silvis, Beverly Sherman, Edith Harlow, Colonel W.C. Koch Jr., fr retired from the U.S. Air Force, Michael Christine Atkinson, David Forsyth, Ed Chevalier and Mary Kennedy, Deborah Plankenhorn, Robert and Diane Ellis, Bernard and Judith Rosenstein, Sandra Smith Volk, Steve and Donna Durack, Karen Mortensen, Scott Paluska and Nancy McElwin, Ann Sickless and Alexander Withers, and Teresa and Robert Sickles, and John and Linda Minor. The following group donated a total of $730 to the Ron Garretts, did I say that right? Memorial Fund, Becky McCabe, Judith O'Connor, Service Wire Company, Kim Smith and David Scadden, Rosemary Laughlin, Belinda Porter and Gregory Wahlberg, Gary and Judy Ring, James and Cl Gloria Perfetti, Jean and Ellen Amberg, Richard Bodine, Staz and Catherine Gorski, Lori Johnson, and Clark and Beth Anderson. Um, from Four Wheels LLC, um, or Scotty's Brew House, um, and Country Squire Cleaners, we received a donation in the total of $225 towards the Pieto Book Bag Fundraiser to support the Martin Luther King Elementary students. Um, the Ruth Kugler Trust um, from Paul Anderson donated for the beautification of Urbana Middle School and we received fabric, decora fabric decorations, floral sprays, sewing supplies, beads, hot glue, paints, and miscellaneous craft supplies valued at $600. It's a lot of sparkles. Uh, Dana Rabin donated a, ya a Yamaha alto sax and a soft alto sax case valued at $1,325 to the Evelyn Burnett Underwood Music Assistance Program at Urbana Middle School. So approval is asked to uh, accept these gifts and write thank yous for them. Can we have a, do we need a roll call so, for that? No, we need a motion first. <laughs> so moved acceptance. Yeah. Do we have a second? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Four you pick. Yes. All right. Just voice vote, okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. No opposed, the motion carries. 12.2, uh, we have to approve the 2019-2020 Urbana School District Adult Education Budget. Does anybody have any last questions about that before we I'll seek approval? I move acceptance of that. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Do we have to roll call yep. that one for the budget? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yeah. Did you, you were making a face. Did you want to offer any other opinions about this? I probably need to point out a couple changes. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. sorry. Before yep. we finish the your your paper. Sorry about that. At your place was a colorful, updated document from the one I provided at the last meeting. I went into more detail at the last meeting, but just wanted to kind of update some changes because um, this has expanded, as you can see from the last meeting. I've added some more information. Okay. Um, what we did, what we what, the one thing that did change was unfortunately to the negative. There was about two hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars of uh, money in the Title One grant. We were working with the wrong total. We thought we had the we thought we didn't have the carryover in the number. The carryover wasn't the number the state was reporting. So we had to move two hundred twenty-two thousand dollars out. Um, that moved, and unfortunately moved those expenses over to the Ed Fund budget. So the Ed Fund budget has um, surplus has gone down by that amount. Uh, the other change um, to this is just adding the carryover balance. Now that the audit was more completed, I was able to get um, the fund balance figures at least estimated more clearly. Mm -hmm. So I've added that column. I and mean, you can see um, because of 
the taxes not coming in like we expected at the end of June. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of negatives, especially in the Ed Fund, um, right. because those uh, funds where we levy taxes, we didn't get about $8.4 million. So that's why the negatives are there. I wanted to make sure I pointed that out. But you can also see that the current year surplus is higher for FY20 because those taxes we didn't get last year got rolled into this year's budget and made the surplus look overly healthy, mm -hmm. better than normal. So what I've done is I've um, taken out the taxes that were received late. So you can kind of get to what the more, that yellow column yeah. is more of the normal. Had we not had this thing happen to us this year, our normal surplus or deficit would be in that yellow column. And then the ending fund balance at the end of all of this, the ending fund balance projected for next year, we should be back to normal. Um, so over these two years, even though last year made it look worse, this year's looking a little better. Over the two years, it's going to be fine. And the other thing that um, I talked about a little bit at the last meeting was the OSF taxes. Mm -hmm. I did check with the uh, county treasurer. OSF has not paid their taxes currently. So even though the tax bills were sent out to OSF, they've been extended, are part of our extensions that we get more than likely we're not going to get this money. So I wanted to make sure to point out that that is a revenues that are included in this budget that if they end up not paying, which is likely, it's going to even be worse by, um, so that's a total of $800,000 in OSF taxes that we won't receive. So for instance, for the education fund, instead of having a $358,000 surplus, we'd more likely have a 212000 deficit. And as I've stated in the past, though, $212,000 here or there is really what I consider mostly balanced because 1% off on when these, thing, when these tax revenues come in is going to swing three to $400,000 in a year or so. Depending on when we receive our taxes, it could really swing either way. So overall, I think it, it looks good, but I just wanted to point out those couple changes so you could be aware of that Thanks. before you approve tonight. To Thank questions. you. I'm sorry, I rushed through that. That's okay. Without thinking. <laughs> so, d are there any questions though before we do finish the motion? No. Okay. So we had a move and seconding. Uh, so, do we have a vote for this then? Ready? Roll. Did, roll yeah. Roll, yeah. Roll, roll call, please. Yeah. Member Exum. Yes. Member Patton. Yes. Member Plosky. Yes. Member Fisher votes yes, and President, uh, Vice President Hall. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. I don't believe we have any call for future. S Do we have call for future nope. special or executive meetings? Um, not at this not time. Yet. Not no. at this time. Okay. Uh, Fourteen point oh, the superintendent's report. Okay. So we're going. So our screen is up. Um, something new that I'd like to, and and actually, Lori, if you want to go back to the picture we had up there before. Um, so you can see we've kind of got a little setup. If, I don't know if our board members noticed, and I know our live TV can't, people can't see it, but behind the TV, we're, we're trying to be um, accommodating for our audience uh, when we have presentations. We're going to have a couple study sessions here coming up. Um, and we've been working with our technology team. So um, one thing that we're, and Randy has been kind of instrumental in that, is we're going to be providing a couple bigger screens where, um, and right now, thank you audience, but we don't have a full house, but when we do have a full house, it's really hard for people to see the presentations. And of course, you know, it's, it's most, it's very important that you guys can see, um, but I think sometimes it's even hard for you to see because of uh, how, our, how, our, how our display is set up. So we're gonna have a screen um, that will, you know, kind of be um, fixed to the, what do you call this, floating ceiling kind of thing that we'll pull down and then over there we have a little screen right now that adult ed uses and we're going to get a larger one okay. um, that adult ed can use um, and so we'll be able to display we'll have kind of a splitter working where we'll have whatever is showing here we'll also show over there so when we have a large audience you yeah. know people will actually be able to see the presentations and see the numbers and and see the grades and see all the you know wonderful things that our administrators and, and community people will come and share with you but we want them to be able to see the presentations yeah. too so um, that will be forthcoming we tried to have it ready for tonight um, for our new little model of the superintendent report but that'll be something that we'll be moving toward hopefully very soon so as soon as we get those screens in so um, moving forward I, I want to kind of again put a lot of our students and our teachers 
um, Cameron's been doing a great job and people have been sending us stories. So we want, when I report those, instead of the camera Austin being on me, we now will put the camera uh, on where it should be so we can highlight the people who I'm gonna be talking about. So while we've been here tonight, the reason, I know we've already acknowledged our wonderful teachers at the high school, I got a text from them. So this is from Laura, Mark, Taryn, and Dave. They know they were on tonight's agenda, so they're apologizing for not being here. And um, because of our babies, kids, dogs, day jobs, and co commutes, we're unable to be there tonight. <laughs> Um, but again, this was for the UHS Habitat Club, like Ann said earlier. Um, however, we appreciate the acknowledgement of our efforts, which have been largely inspired by the awesomeness of our students. In lieu of our attendance this evening, please let everyone on the board know that we extend an invitation to drop by either of our two upcoming local Habitat, habitat builds. This Thursday, they will have 19 students at 507 East Columbia in Champaign between 8 and 3. They will be working again on Saturday at a two determined at a, a TBD location, but any interested board member can email us for their address. We'd be happy to have any of them come by and check out what we do. Thanks for all you do, Laura, Mark, Taryn, and Dave. So there they are, our, our lovely high school folks. So our next item we wanna highlight is, um, I sent this email to just a few people. Our um, parent advisory, our district parent teacher advisory committee was supposed to be starting up tomorrow, but I don't have enough people to meet, so I'm gonna cancel the first meeting. I think I was a little over ambitious <laughs> and thought I would just have, you know, all these people like, you know, jumping up and down to be on this committee. And I, I do have a couple, but I, not enough where I felt like we had an, an, a, a large enough group to be able to start making any decisions. So Tori and Brenda are my board members. Um, I've sent an email out. Um, I uh, am still waiting to get, because this is, I know teacher's not up there, but this is a teacher advisory group too. So I, I still need a couple UEA teachers. So I, I gotta get those from Brian Lake. Um, we did have some parents who I was kind of recruiting to be on this committee, but we have several other working committees going on. So people, you know, are kind of picking and choosing. Um, I know Scott's out there. He wants to, to do some PTA council things. We had another person who was going to be part of this group who now wants to be part of the marketing and communications group with Cameron. So, um, you know, I, I we want our parents to, to be in the spaces where they feel like they can be utilized the most. So right now I need to get a more representative group. I only have like two or three people. And I definitely want um, elementary, middle, early childhood, high school represented and as many buildings. So my goal is we already had October 22nd and December 3rd set. So we were gonna meet three times this semester. Um, so now our first meeting will be October 22nd, and that gives me a little more time to now go out and try to, um, I, I'm gonna remind our administrators tomorrow, principals meetings, if you have had uh, parents come to you and say they're interested, please send me their names. Um, we had um, a great family forum event last Monday at Urbana Neighborhood Connection Center where we had a lot of interested parents, so I'm gonna reach out to a couple of those people who, who have, again, they're volunteering to be on other committees, but you know, see if they would be interested in, in being a part of this group too. So I just wanted to put that out for the viewing public. If you're interested in being part of the District Parent Teacher Advisory Committee, please let me know. Our first meeting will now be October 22nd. Okay, all right, Lori, we can go to the next one. All right, so I, I hope most of you saw this story. Um, another, highlighting another one of our um, high school students, uh, Olivia Rosenstein, um, was highlighted, I think this was just last week, the National, oh yes, it, became, it was public on Wednesday, National Merit Scholarship Corporation named her a student semifinalist um, for the National Merit Scholarship Program. So she's one out of 1.6 million students, and that's a great achievement. So if you've not had a chance to read that story, please go on. Um, there's a picture of her wearing her medal. Um, she'll take the SAT again, and depending on how she, um, how, what her score is like this next time she takes it, she might not be a semifinalist, she might be a finalist. So if in the event that happens, we'll have her come back and again recognize her in person, but there she is, so kudos to Olivia. And this is from our band. 
So um, this weekend, our uh, band, and I, oh, I forgot my note. I thought they got first place in, camera didn't put it on there. I've got to look for it. Does anybody know first place in percussion? And we've got band parents out there. And wins, and second place overall. So here's a couple of those pictures. So you can see their, their trophies and um, some of their line formations. So congratulations again to the Tiger Marching Band. This was in Monticello. So we're excited for them. They're gonna have a great season. So next is cross country. So shout out to our band across country who started the year off strong. We had a great story for them. This is just one of the pictures they, um, the coach, um, Coach Faroki sent us some great pictures. The UHS girls teams finished second in their invite um, and the boys finished first. So this was a first invite victory for the boys in over a decade. So you can see from the picture, they're super excited. Um, Olivia Rosenstein took home the individual victory on the girls' side, beating the best next best runner by 45 seconds. Um, uh, Celia Barberi, Ashley Gilbert, and Sophie all blew their previous performances out of the water. Sam Lambert led the boys to the team win, and Park Mitchell had the best improvement over last year, dropping over a minute off his time to finish 10th behind se uh, senior Jeremy Bucata. So they're super excited. So congrats to their band across country team. And then Splash is off and starting um, at the middle school and the high school. This has been, I've heard, had a lot of families asking me about it. Um, I was going to bring my booklet in here. So here's the orange booklet for the middle school. Um, we put the session times and dates. Cameron is going to have these online too. We're, we're trying to make sure that we've, we've heard from families that they want to have an opportunity. Right now the students have to go pick these up in the office or they have to go to the counselor's office at the high school or the main office at the middle school. Um, but a lot of families have said, hey, if you just put it online, we can print the form out. Because um, relying on my seventh grader to go pick it up is sometimes not happening. I remember that from my own experience. Um, so Splash has started. And then the next one is, uh, I was going to do the, did he do the high school tutoring one? No, he did not. So I have a visual for that. So um, also happening at the high school is tutoring has started. Um, I've had a lot of families at the UHS open house and at um, just other at the family forum wanting to know how they can get some additional help for their high school students. So tutoring has started at the high school after school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I have a paper for that buried in all these papers somewhere. Oh, here it is. Free after school tutoring before and after school. And the high school is going to have a Spanish speaking tutor available at all sessions. Um, so we've had a lot of um, families asking about math and Spanish. So that'll be available before school Mondays, 725 to 755, and Wednesdays, 725 to 55 in the cafeteria. After school tutoring at the high school Tuesdays, 330 to 430 in the library and Thursdays, 3.30 to 4.30 in the library. So Monday, Wednesday before school, Tuesday, Thursday after. So parents, if your kids aren't telling you about it, it's happening and we can get you the information if you need it. So it'll be on the web, that'll be on the website too. And this last one, oh, we've got two more actually. This last one is um, big thank you to Miss Abbott's first grade class at King. They uh, sent some thank yous to the Ed Scott Fire Protection District. And the firefighters there were really excited and took some photos. So that's that. And tomorrow, last one, you don't have a big visual for this, but so battle for the paddle. So t <laughs> have you guys heard about this? Oh, yeah. So this is uh, tomorrow, Dr. Zola and I are battling for the paddle. We're playing ping pong. I don't have my own paddle. I hope if she's watching, she doesn't have hers. But anyway, um, so this is a fundraiser for United Way. And um, this will be happening at Hickory Point Bank in downtown Champaign. Um, Dr. Zola and I are set to battle for the paddle at 830. Um, and it's all for fundraising for United Way. So anyone who pledges, you can, I think you can still pledge. So if you pledge for me, you know, if those pledges will go whoever wins. So you have to kind of pledge like who's going to win. So if I'm going to beat her, if she's going to beat me, but all the proceeds go to United Way. 
We'll be in costume too, so I'm sure there'll be pictures. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to give it away yet. So that's it. Battle for the paddle tomorrow. I'll have to let you know if I win or not, or Susan might cream me. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> that's it for me. We do have um, some FOIA requests. We have three. Uh, first is from Dr. Donald Owen uh, with Lead for Equity and Engagement LLC, requesting student expulsion information for the years tw 2008 through 2019, including the number of students recommended, disaggregated by school year, grade level, gender, race, IEP status, and free and reduced lunch status, the reason for expulsion, determination of the board in each case, and the length of each expulsion. Uh, student drug offense information from 2008 to 2019, including the number of student offenses that involve, quote, possessing, distributing, purchasing, selling, or offering for sale any illegal drug or con controlled substance, end quote, disaggregated by school year, grade level, gender, race, IEP status, and free and reduced lunch status. Consequences, including length, suspension, or expulsion, or other. From Jonathan Massey from New York University, we have a FOIA to approve and approve and rejected charter. I, I assume that means approved and rejected charter school applications. The charter school authorizer name, authorizer's decision, the date of the decision for the period of June 2013 to February 2017, and one from Keith F. Galloway of DRG Holdings LLC requesting a copy of the transportation contract or contracts with the current transportation vendor. And I don't know if those have already been taken care of. They have all been taken care of. Okay. Next, board reports. Do we have any board reports? Well, I just wanted to mention since our last board meeting, I attended the program council, um, which is a, a meeting of instructional leaders, department chairs, and grade level leaders district-wide. Yvonne Smith is facilitating that um, body this year. And um, the focus in the program council this year is on data assessment, what, what types of data are being collected, how they're being used and reported. Um, and I was impressed in the small groups that were reporting on their uses of data. You know, it's, it was clear that there's various approaches to data collection and analysis and just a real stated commitment to using da data to inform best practices and, and really drive change just wide. So it's a good group and I'm glad it's, it's, it's back and, and moving well. Good. Yeah. Thank you for coming, Peggy. Other board reports? Well, yes. <laughs> we do, Anne. <laughs> Anne and I had lunch at the high school today. Oh. Had a very pleasant experience. My first time, at, well, since going through the old line when I was a student, of course. Um, the food all looked delicious. We've heard that everyone is loving the food. Uh, I liked what my, I selected today, which was the ham wrap. And it was also packaged. You could, you could do a lot of different things at all the stations and whatever. I picked up something that was pre-packed and it also had uh, the macaroni salad and very nicely, finely chopped uh, pieces of pineapple with it so I was very pleased with my mail my meal and I want to thank Ann for suggesting it she emailed me yesterday and says hey you want to go to lunch sometime this week maybe I said yeah yeah let's do it my my schedule is free so thank you Ann I'm glad we went I I always like to go because I I want to trust my kids when they tell me that something is good or bad but they say the same about my own food so I want to <laughs> Test it out. I, I found that, um, the, like, the setup was the same as last year when we had Aramark in that, you know, we had the main entree selection and then you could walk to the station where the Subway-style sandwiches were and then there was the pizza and everything. So I haven't, I don't know if the menu items have changed significantly since we had Aramark, but it was, ch it was chicken quesadillas today and they were nice enough to let me pick toppings from the sandwich station to put on my quesadilla and it, I don't know if it's just because I was a grown up who'd gone or what, but it was, yeah, it was nice and the process was smooth and and it also was really quiet i have to say too not just about the food but because of the new system that we've got where we've got the upperclassmen having six period the ones who are allowed to go off campus to eat 
it just I mean I don't think it was ever the noise level has ever been crazy at the high school but it was so much quieter than what I thought it was going to be and there was just there were still empty tables and places where kids could go and nobody was packed in like sardines so it was a very smooth transition even when the transition period happened I thought it was really nice nice done definitely. Yeah. Um, if we're on board reports I just wanted to um, remind there was an email that we got about the um, the open house coming up I think it's before our next meeting it's I think October 3rd next week with uh, um, the CU Schools Foundation Fowler Farm open house um, I went to it last year and or maybe it was two years ago and it was really fun I mean it's way 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 the heck out west and I could not tell you how to get there but um, it's on Google Maps but um, it was fun because we got to see all the kids with all the hands-on work they'd done with the chicken coop they'd built and all of the the flowers and the vegetables and things they were growing and the way they'd been working on the land just to clear the land out and build structures it was really exciting and they had a food truck available which I think is going to be there again sponsored by Hendrick House so if anybody wants to know I, it was middle schoolers and I think we had some high schoolers there and I don't know if they're expanding it to include more kids because it's both unit 4 and 116 great and they would love to see anybody out there from Urbana who wants to go and give support to it so if the weather's good it's from five till seven next week and I'm gonna Kim's gonna go it's the second oh it's actually. the second I'm sorry yep. sorry yep. thank yep. you Kim's gonna go um, and Angie's gonna be representing us um, at another meeting and I'm gonna be at Luda so I'm not gonna be able to go but Kim's going to be so thank you for remembering that they're also going to be um, uh, dedicating the pavilion that they've been building and oh, working right. on all summer so this will be kind of the big like opening night for the the new pavilion out there so i'm glad you remember to say that thank you if it's anything like the weather tonight or what, last year it was so nice and it was just just nice to get outside of the country and fresh air that's the that's why i got my dates mixed up that's a thursday right okay and the second is a wednesday okay yes it's in mattoon Three of us are gone. Okay. Oh, okay. We've got at least three Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think we have any other board reports, so I think adjournment would be in order. Do we have a movement? Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.